You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. There is no guarantee that Pierre Polyev will be the next federal conservative leader. It's safe to say, though, that he's a heavy favorite. And while he's been on Parliament Hill for almost two decades, there's a lot Canadians don't know about him. In fact, they mostly know him for one thing. If you've been introduced to Polyev through news clips over the past year, or 10 years, or 20 years, you know him as an attack dog. But the Prime Minister says he doesn't think much about monetary policy. Clearly. Uh, that's no surprise. After all, it's just in inflation. <laughs> People feel like they're losing control of their lives, whether it is the countless small business people who've been flattened by endless lockdowns and rules. That kind of stuff is Polyev's bread and butter. And even the people across the aisle from him say he's very, very good at it. But is that all there is to him? It is pretty easy to see and hear what he's against, but what is he for? When he says, He wants to make Canada the freest country on earth. What does that really mean? Is there another side to him? Who, exactly, is Pierre Polyev? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Shannon Proudfoot is the Ottawa bureau chief for Maclean's magazine. She recently spent some time with the hopeful conservative leader and wrote a pretty thorough profile. Hi, Shannon. Hi there. Can you maybe start, just for those of us who haven't paid perhaps enough attention uh, to Pierre Polyev as an MP, where did he come from? What's his background? Yeah. So it, it's funny. I want to start by saying that I, I actually hate comic book movies and like have no use for them as a viewer. But I found myself thinking when I was researching this story that he has sort of the perfect origin story for a Western Canadian conservative. Like you really couldn't have better bona fides. So he was born and grew up in Preston Manning's riding in Calgary. So, you know, there's point number one yeah. in, in the 80s. He's in his early 40s now. And he, from the time before he could even drive. He was writing letters to the editor, you know, incensed about things like Paul Martin increasing Canada pension plan premiums or the idea of sort of fiscal responsibility, the national energy program. So he was a teenager when he was first sort of making his voice heard about those issues. So actually, one of the things that came up is he sort of has this remarkably consistent set of beliefs that have like seemingly not budged at all in the last 20 years. He got his start, sort of leapt over to politics uh, when he was in his early 20s. He was one of the volunteers. I love this. They nicknamed themselves Fight Club because it was around the year 2000 (laughs) and they were young men. So of course they did. Of course. Uh, And these were the volunteers who were working the phone banks in Stockwell Day's office when he was running for the leadership of the Canadian Alliance, which of course is one of the parties that later gave birth to the modern Conservative Party. And after volunteering for Stockwell Day's leadership campaign, a couple of years later, Day was elected as as an MP and uh, invited Polyev to work in his office in Ottawa. And that was sort of his one-way ticket from Calgary to Ottawa. He did not intend it to be a one-way ticket. He thought it would be sort of a young man's lark for a couple of years, and he never went back. How did he end up an MP then if he never went back to Calgary? And by the way, those are some impressive conservative bona fides. It pretty much checks like every box. Yeah, no, seriously. It's almost hilarious. It's like he was grown in like a Petri dish to be a conservative MP. So about two years after he went to work for Day, so still very young, he was only 24 when he first ran to be an MP in this sort of massive suburban rural riding outside of Ottawa. I think to a lot of people who are local, it would read as more rural. It was called Nepean Carleton when he first ran. Now it's called Carleton. So 2004 was the first election and he succeeded in unseating the liberal, the sitting liberal defense minister, David Pratt at the time. So a pretty big win for like a 25 year old still kind of wet behind the ears to unseat a sitting cabinet minister. And he has just kept winning since then. He's been an MP for two decades now, which is sort of remarkable considering how young he is. And that was sort of his leap up to being a politician himself as opposed to supporting them as as a partisan. So part of the reason that we wanted to talk to you is because your profile was very in-depth and it gave us a picture of who he is or who he was um, before he sort of became the person I think 
lots of us have gotten to know over the last six months to a year or so. So I guess what I'd love to find out is after he became an MP, you know, what kind of reputation did he develop in the House of Commons? Like, who was he when he was still um, a backbencher? Yeah, so this is very key, I think, to understanding his political career. The answer is that he kind of vaulted himself out of being a backbencher almost immediately because of his willingness to be a partisan attack dog. I mean, you think when someone in their mid-20s gets elected, normally they're going to be riding the backbenches for like 10 years. There's Mm -hmm. no reason anyone would know their names, that they would have any sort of profile. And he very much did not do that. He, He kind of became known almost immediately for being a very devoted partisan. Any attack on the conservatives, like sort of raised his hackles and and got him sailing in with his his fists balled up. And then when they were in government, he was very much in a defensive posture all the time. And, And so that's really the way he made his name. Now, I can make some guesses about why that might have been. One of the things I, I know about him um, from people in his past have said he's he's very, very smart, first of all, very smart. It's obvious when you talk to him, when you look at the way he speaks in the House. He's also a very strategic thinker. So if you think about that, the choice to be a partisan attack dog was probably just that. And I, I mean, look, he became a household name within a few years of being elected in a way that you never normally would be. If you were in your mid-20s and were elected, you would just be kind of a nobody. So I am guessing, I can't know what's in someone's heart, but I'm thinking that was a way to make a name for himself. It was a way to make a reputation and it worked. Prime Minister Stephen Harper named him a parliamentary secretary to the Treasury Board president. At the time, that was John Baird, who was very much kind of the prototype of what what Pierre Polyev became, um, that kind of hyper-partisan sort of loyalist and attack dog. And then he became a cabinet minister eventually. He also served, I should say, as uh, parliamentary secretary to the prime minister himself, who is sort of like your chief bouncer, I suppose, in the House of Commons. So Hmm. it worked like for again, I can't peer into his heart and know why that is the path he chose. But it it sure did raise his profile and give him a, a very distinct role in the House that I think he might not have had otherwise for 10 or 15 years, if at all. So given all that, then, as you know, he becomes the front runner, I guess, in the conservative leadership race, and you decide to do a fairly in-depth profile on him and you get some time to sit down and chat with him. As you're prepping all that, what are you expecting from him? Yeah. So one thing, first of all, I just want to interject and say that this profile was the luckiest timing of anything in my career, because I actually started saying to my colleagues back in the summer and through the fall, we should do a profile of Polyev. He's an interesting dude. He's an alternate power center in the party. You know, when Aaron O'Toole was still the leader and there was a lot of dissatisfaction with him, you could just feel that there was sort of this electricity that crackled off of Polyev for the very people who were upset with O'Toole. So this actually started out just as an idea to profile an interesting conservative who was clearly going to be prominent for a while. And then in very short order, uh, the caucus knifed O'Toole and we launched into a leadership race in which Polyev was not only the first person to throw his hat in, but is still, I think, the front runner. Listen, that's not luck. That's good news judgment. (laughs) Well, yeah, sure. A little of A, a little of B. I'm willing to concede to luck. But yeah, I I originally, this is a little bit of how the sausage is made, but I did not expect him to talk to me. He typically doesn't do broad interviews. He doesn't like to do interviews about himself. He'll talk to reporters about discrete policy issues or talking points that he's trying to advance. But I know one of my colleagues a couple of years ago tried for months and months and months to get him to just do an interview, just talk about stuff how you do your thing, and he wouldn't do it. Hmm. So I was going into this story thinking I was going to have to construct it with kind of an absence at its center. And at first I actually thought I was being a bit fancy. I thought uh, (laughs) I can make that a feature and not a bug because I thought at the time that kind of the germane thing about Polyev was the way he makes people react. So I thought, I'll make the story about everyone around him and about how, I mean, to me, the kind of analogy is he's sort of like a hockey pest where his job is to rile people up enough to take penalties and that's the advantage he furnishes for his team. Right. But in, very late in the game, I was already like through all of my other interviews with everyone else and kind of thinking about the structure of the story. I started realizing, first of all, that's not really the story of who he is. We can talk in a minute about the kind of contrast I see at the center of him and what I thought was sort of the most kind of compelling and frustrating thing about him. But then all of a sudden his his flack, his communications person said he talked to me. And I didn't, I mean, I kind of knew what to expect. I figured I'd get a version of him, you know, what we see in the house or in the scrums which is just 
a partisan talking point on legs. Like just don't concede an inch. Yeah. Everything the other party does is evil. Everything we do is righteous and defensible. And that wasn't it. Um, I found him really interesting to talk to. We ended up talking for almost an hour, which was quite a bit longer than we were scheduled for. So I, I think it must've been a good conversation, but there was, there was a real person in there. Like it, it was very interesting for someone who is so much about the partisan fisticuffs to get a sense of sort of why he believes what he does, where this is rooted in his own story. There's still, I would argue, some pretty huge inconsistencies in which what he advances, even based on sort of the principles he says he stands for. But it was a very interesting thing to kind of pull back that partisan curtain and see like a real person behind the wizard sort of deal. That's what I'm interested in as well, because I think a lot of us who are more casual observers of politics only see those 15 second gotchas or, you know, slamming Trudeau or standing with the truckers. And he makes a lot of statements like that. So, I mean, the biggest one that he's made uh, since announcing his run for leader is when he says he's going to make Canada the freest country on earth, which is one of those one of those political statements that could be interpreted to mean absolutely anything. Do you have a sense of what he's talking about? What's behind that when he says that kind of thing? Yeah. So we talked about that at length because that has sort of, he sort of made that his tagline of his leadership run. It's a curiously American sounding thing, right? It's very classic, small government, libertarian. I did ask him, do you think there's a market for that in Canada? It just doesn't seem to me like the kind of thing that, that resonates as much in our politics or with people. So the way he articulated it, I mean, I asked him, what does that mean on the ground? Like, that's an interesting concept. It wasn't a cross-examination question, just like walk out how that would manifest. And he listed things like, you know, uh, we shouldn't have immigrants coming here from other countries who are qualified for, for highly qualified jobs and end up driving cabs. We should eliminate the red tape of that sort of thing. People should be able to start businesses without all this bureaucracy or, you know, of course, uh, fiscal responsibility and, and, and sort of financial freedom is a big thing for him. So the government shouldn't be scraping too many taxes out of you or spending into a deficit and, and you know, spending your kids money in, in his rendition of the facts. So it's sort of those classic small government kind of contentions. I would argue that that's not really the reason he's saying it. And that's not really what people are hearing when he says it. I mean, we've seen him in the last few months and even before that really latch on to this broad idea of freedom. If you attach it to the trucker protest, in that case, that meant freedom for me personally to do what I want, you know, regardless of what else is going on. And so I would argue that he is much more advancing this kind of general, broad, choose your own adventure sense of freedom, that that is kind of, if it's not what he's making himself stand for, I think it's what other people hear when he says that and what they see in him. What do we know so far, if anything? I mean, I'm glad you mentioned a couple of potential policies behind uh, the freest country on earth, but The thing I still uh, didn't have a sense of, at least until I I read your profile, is what he is behind the Trudeau bad guy and freedom good guy. And, And there is something there, but we really don't see it very much. Yeah. So, I mean, I would argue there is a lot more there. I don't think that's what he's putting on the table. I think if he wins as leader... Uh, And I think he stands a very good chance to do that as things are right now. A lot could change. It will be because of that. It will be a kind of um, general freedom promotion and also this kind of gleefully angry own the lib sort of energy. I mean, that is where Canadian politics are right now. It's very tribal. And he is, uh, his fellow MP, Mark Strahl, I thought put it really well. Like he said, he is the voice of the base. And that's what he is. To me, what you have in the leadership right now is sort of the embodiment of the kind of existential dilemma facing the conservatives right now. And you could argue that Polyev is sort of the mascot of one of those things. Like Mm -hmm. Polyev is the the base pleasing sort of hardline more right leaning own the libs end of this i think that that has limited growth potential you will make people very very happy on the right end of the spectrum but that's where the conservatives already dominate and that is not a growth strategy in the story i referred to him as sort of a delicious dessert but not the broccoli that's going to let the party grow i don't think a lot of people currently in the conservative tent would be at all displeased with polyev but I don't think they're going to get a lot of swing voters or draw in more people into a bigger tent. Um, So that's sort of how I see the state of play as it's represented by him as a candidate. 
And there's a contradiction there inside him that you wrestle with a lot uh, in the profile. It's kind of at the core of it, I think, is that, you know, he is a student of history. He is able to go on on 10 minute dissertations on YouTube about, you know, individual policies or speechwriters of the past. And, and as you point out, he's really, really smart and can be really insightful about politics. But none of that comes through in his public persona. Did you talk with him about that? And if that's a conscious choice and and if he might let that other side out a little bit more, because that maybe would give him some of what you're talking about when you talk about the broccoli that could attract new members. Yeah, it's it's quite a thing to talk to him one on one because he is he's so smart. He can be quite self-deprecating, you know, as everyone does in a one on one conversation. He lets his guard down a bit more, but it's hard not to be a bit frustrated and disappointed by the fact that all of that is there. I mean, look, frankly, there are a lot of people on Parliament Hill who have less to offer. They're just they're not that smart. They're not that insightful. He has, there's so much there and I don't feel like he puts it in the shop window. Now, I did talk to him about that at at length. We had a few back and forths about it and he just sort of wouldn't entertain the idea or disagreed with the premise. His his contention is, I am not that attack dog. If you look at, say, uh, the videos on my social media channels that get the most views from people, it's these long, you know, he does like 10 minute kind of monologue, sort of graduate level seminars on like the history of money. And so his contention is, that that's what people really love him for. Now, I find that really interesting. There's two ways to take that. One is he's BSing me and he knows darn well that he's an attack dog. And sure, he's capable of these other things. He's he's really smart and he's capable of these long riffs on really complicated ideas. So one possibility is that he knows that that is not really how he's made a name for himself politically. And he's sort of trying to argue with a reporter who's advancing a thesis that's not very flattering. The other possibility I actually find more interesting on a, on a human level, which is that maybe he really doesn't think he's that guy. Maybe he's really kind of puzzled and annoyed on some level. The rest of us keep seeing him as this angry pipsqueak when he sees himself as um, kind of being more professorial, as having more to offer. There is, I think, some evidence that he's tried to moderate a little bit since 2015. He had sort of a, a near miss in the election there. He, he, he re-won his seat by the skin of his teeth. So it's also kind of an interesting human question. Like, if you think you're one thing and everyone else in the world sees you as something else, who's right? Hmm. And I, I, I don't know. Again, there, there is a heavy possibility that there's some political gamesmanship going on in that back and forth. But he just sort of wouldn't entertain the idea that he is this kind of partisan ankle biter. And what I actually wanted to know was, tell me how that's the choice you made. Like, tell me what went into that strategic decision earlier in your career. How do you decide what kind of politician you're going to be? And he just he just didn't agree with the premise. So so we didn't go very far on that conversation. Well, you mentioned at the beginning that your original plan was to write this story uh, without Polyev, without any comment from him. And so I guess I'm interested in what his counterparts and colleagues in the House of Commons think of him, because you can watch him in question period and and get a sense that this is a guy that must really annoy the crap out of everyone, that everybody must dislike, but that doesn't seem to be the case. No, I found that really interesting. So I picked a couple of the the kind of people who also enjoy sailing into the ring from the other parties. So I talked to Charlie Angus from the NDP and Kevin Lamaru from the Liberals. And there are other like big talkers in the House of Commons. They're really good at debate. They love to kind of get in there and mix it up. And to be honest, I sort of expected both of them to say, he drove them up the wall. And and I mean, they did concede that he can really get under people's skin. But from both of them, there was a, a hefty dose of like game recognizes game. Like they mm. they enjoyed sparring with him. They both said he's terrific at it, which is really neat, right? Like if the other big debaters and partisan brawlers in the house recognize that you're very good at what you do, that's a particular thing. So I, I was sort of surprised that they said, yeah, you know, he's very good at riling people up and getting reactions. But like, I respect what he does. He's very talented at it. The one really interesting thing that I thought came up that Charlie Angus said is, he said, you know, Pierre's so good at politics. Like, he's so good at kind of the the gamesmanship of it. But I don't see what it's all for. Like, Angus was saying, I, I don't get what his underlying point is. And I put that to Polyev when we talked. I said, you know, this is a person who who respects you as an MP, who says you're really talented at this. This wasn't like a partisan drive-by swipe. But they say 
there's a kind of emptiness at the core of what you're doing. It's like you're just trying to score partisan points day after day, year after year. And what is the bigger purpose? So I said to him, like, if that's your means, what is the ends? And we came back to his current political tagline. He said, the ends is to make Canada the freest country on earth. Hmm. And again, it's that is an interesting contention to me. I know what he thinks it means or what he says it means, but I, I'm I'm not sure what other people will think that means. Well, I have to say reading uh, not just the profile, but you also transcribed the whole conversation and people people can read it at mcleans.ca. And you used the word frustrated a little bit ago. And and that's what I take away from, you know, this this transcript is, you know, you're repeatedly trying to get him to kind of come out of his shell and and not reduce himself to the the attack dog. And he just kind of disputes the premise of almost every question. And I I kind of get a sense from that, and maybe you do too, what it must be like to spar with him in the House of Commons. I have to say, I actually found that a really good interview. In In the middle, it gets pretty contentious, and you can see that in the transcript. I thought there was a lot of useful back and forth there. You're absolutely right that there were a bunch of things he just wouldn't entertain, and, and we kind of couldn't get far like the nice thing about doing a long interview with someone and writing a profile is that I was genuinely seeking to understand. Like mm-hmm. this wasn't a press conference where you're you're trying to get the person to just sort of give you the money quote and dispute what their opponent said. I, I was honestly trying to understand where he's coming from and what he's trying to do. And I do feel like I came away understanding more. But, and as I wrote this in the end of the profile, but there's a certain moment, like you can be having a good conversation with him and like, okay, I get this. I'm understanding where you're coming from. I'm I'm getting a glimpse of your thinking. I see how this is rooted in your life experience. And then if you sort of accidentally say something that like triggers that partisan instinct, you go right back into sort of the question period version of Pierre Polyev. And it, it's this weird sort of deja vu where you think, oh, right, I remember this guy. And mm. you're just sort of waiting for the storm to pass so you can go back to having a better conversation. There was sort of this underlying kind of frustration or almost like an intellectual sort of sadness, I suppose, in talking to him because I thought, like, this is what you're capable of. Like, this is what you could give to Canadian politics. Like, you're so darn smart. And, you know, uh, people could disagree very ferociously with a lot of the things he believes. But there was a sense of coherency to what he believes and, and a sense of depth of thought and insight. And that's not what we really get from him on the public stage. So it's this sort of there's the cardboard cutout version, and then there's the real guy, and they're quite different. And it's it's sort of hard not to be kind of mesmerized and a bit disappointed by the kind of distance between the two. Well, the last thing I want to ask you about is sort of uh, what Poliev, I guess, would hope is the inevitable end game, And that's, you know, he wins the leadership. Um, it doesn't look like we'll have an election anytime soon, but, you know, who knows when the next federal election is. And he becomes prime minister. You kind of asked him a little bit about how his current persona, you know, the attack dog guy, the the guy who loves to spar, how that would translate to being a governing prime minister. And he kind of said it would be the same. And I, I just don't know how that translates to somebody actually wielding power rather than someone seeking it. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because it's that's not really the mode of someone who's in charge of the government. Um, you could even be that person if you're an MP in the governing party, which he was when the Harper government was in power. But if if you are the prime minister, the idea that you would keep balling up your fists and fighting every fight that comes your way, it's just a bit, it's a bit strange, right? It's a bit unseemly. Now, of course, he's going to say, no, I won't moderate at all. Like, this is really me. Because to suggest that you would moderate or shift directions is sort of tantamount to suggesting that you're kind of wearing a mask or you're playing a role. Right. So yeah, he said it will be no different. When, when I asked him, you know, what would Pierre Polyev's Canada look like? If you become leader, if you become prime minister, and again, when we talked a month or two ago, it seemed likely that there would be an election maybe in the next year. Now we're looking at three and a half years from now. So that sort of changes things. But he again listed sort of these discrete examples of red tape he wanted to get rid of and went back to that idea of Canada being the freest country on earth. So it's kind of, I mean, it's an unsatisfying answer that we have to sort of wait and see. But I wonder if the biggest impact and difference if he were to become prime minister wouldn't just be tonally. I mean, it's very hard to know what someone would do in a new role. But look, the guy's been in federal politics for 20 years and he hasn't really changed the way he plays the game. So it's it's a bit hard to imagine he would if he was suddenly sitting in the prime minister's office. But it is a very strange thing to contemplate, like the pest on the team becoming the captain who does all the interviews in the press conferences and still maintaining that mode. 
they do have a long runway now before the next election. I actually think that's going to be very, very good for the party because they've developed what I would diagnose as a really destructive habit in the last few years. They keep offing their leaders instead of thinking mm-hmm. more broadly about why they not might not be attracting voters. So, you know, as I say, I still think it's most likely that Polyev ends up becoming leader, but whoever does is going to have to like cool their heels and figure out how to do the job for three years before, you know, or maybe even two years if things fall apart at some point before they face the electorate again. And I think that's probably the best thing for the party, even if it's it's not very emotionally satisfying for them in the moment. Shannon, thank you so much for this and for for writing the profile. I feel like I have a much better sense of of who a guy that's going to be important the next couple years is. He is. He's not going away. Thanks for having me. Shannon Proudfoot, Ottawa Bureau Chief for McLean's. That was The Big Story. For more from us, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. Find us on Twitter at TheBigStoryFPN. Talk to us anytime on email, thebigstorypodcast at rci.rogers.com. And of course, we are in every single podcast player that you could possibly imagine. We'd love it if wherever you find us, you'd leave a rating and a review if they let you. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.